Hi everyone, and welcome back to my channel. As of this recording, we have just reached over a thousand subscribers. I am so excited as to the growth of this channel. Remember, if you like this video and its content, please subscribe and share it so that this channel can continue to grow and I can continue to make these awesome educational videos for you. In today's video, we are going to take a look at a hot topic. We are going to look at conventional vaccines, vaccines that are already have been in use, what they are, and how they differ from the new mRNA vaccines. Before we talk about conventional vaccines, let's talk about the history of vaccines and how they even came about. In order to understand where vaccines came from, we need to talk about smallpox. Smallpox is thought to date back to the Egyptian empire around the third century BCE. Smallpox holds a unique place in medicine. It was one of the deadliest diseases known to humans and to date is the only human disease to have been eradicated by vaccination. On average, about three out of every 10 people who got smallpox died. In the early 18th century, it's estimated that the disease killed about 400,000 people every year in Europe alone. In 1721, there was a smallpox outbreak in the U.S. city of Boston that wiped out 8% of the population. Smallpox would cause body ache, high fevers, sore throats, headaches, and even difficulty breathing. The worst part was a pus-filled rash that you would get all over your body. And even if you survived, many people went blind and all were left with scars, some of them nastier than others. However, as time went on, there was one known cure. This was known as inoculation or variolation, which involved taking the pus from someone who had smallpox and scratching it into the skin of a healthy individual. There is evidence that suggests the Chinese employed this smallpox inoculation as early as 1000 CE and that it was also practiced in Africa and Turkey before it spread to Europe and the Americas. This inoculation usually resulted in the individual getting a mild case of the disease. But not always. The problem was that sometimes people contracted full-on smallpox and those that were inoculated with this smallpox pus became carriers of the disease, passing it on to others. Therefore, a better solution was needed. In 1796, Edward Jenner, who was an English doctor, observed that milkmaids who previously had caught cowpox did not catch smallpox. Cowpox is a disease that was similar to smallpox, but much more mild. This observation intrigued him, and it made him decide to try an experiment, one that could be potentially fatal on a child. In order to further test his observations, Jenner took the pus from cowpox lesions on the hands of a milkmaid named Sarah Nelms and inoculated it onto the skin of a nine-year-old boy named James Phipps. James was the son of Jenner's gardener. James had a few days of mild illness and recovered. Later, Jenner exposed James several times to the smallpox virus, but James never developed smallpox. Although his experiment did work, fortunately for the boy, these practices would be completely unethical today. More experiments followed, and in 1801, Jenner published his work, on the origin of the vaccine inoculation, where he summarized his discoveries. At this point, vaccination became widely accepted and gradually replaced the practice of variolation. The smallpox vaccine paved the way for vaccinations. These vaccines, as just mentioned, used a weaker virus, cowpox, in order to generate immunity. Cowpox was similar enough to smallpox but didn't usually cause serious illness. Rabies was the next vaccine to make an impact on human disease in 1885. This vaccine, which was developed by Louis Pasteur, was the first attenuated virus vaccination. Attenuated virus vaccinations contain live viruses that have been grown in the lab and weakened or altered so that they do not cause illness. 
He attenuated this virus by passing the virus through a rabbit host, making it less dangerous to humans. However, in 1908, the rabies vaccine was improved and made an inactive vaccine by chemically inactivating the rabies virus with phenol. Since then, the vaccine has been continually improved upon, but it is still now given as an inactive vaccine. Now, in present day, several methods are used in order to make conventional vaccines. They include live viruses that have been attenuated, inactivated or killed organisms or viruses, inactivated toxins, or just using segments of the pathogen. This includes both subunit and conjugate vaccines. Let's talk about all of these in more detail. Live, attenuated vaccines, as I mentioned before, are made from weakened or altered virus or bacteria so that they do not cause illness. However, in order to produce an immune response, these live attenuated vaccines must be able to replicate or grow in the vaccinated individual. A small dose of virus or bacteria is given. It can then replicate in the body and then stimulate an immune response. Even though they are able to replicate, they do not usually cause disease as would occur with the wild form of the organism. If it does cause disease, it is usually much more mild than the natural disease and is referred to as an adverse reaction. Live attenuated vaccinations include measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR combined vaccine, varicella, which is for chicken pox, the influenza vaccine, specifically the nasal spray, rotavirus, zoster, which is for shingles, and yellow fever. Inactivated or killed vaccines are made by growing the bacterium or virus in a culture media and then inactivating it with heat and or chemicals. These vaccines are not alive and therefore they cannot replicate. These vaccines cannot cause disease from infection. These usually require many doses as the first dose primes the immune system. Over time, the antibody titers to the antigens from these vaccines will be reduced and a booster vaccine may be needed in order to keep immunity. Inactivated killed vaccines include polio, hepatitis A, and rabies. Inactivated toxin vaccines are referred to as toxoids. When it comes to bacteria, some diseases caused by the bacteria are actually due to the toxin they release and not the bacteria itself. An example of this is tetanus. In this case, the vaccinations are made by inactivating the toxin of the bacteria that is causing the disease symptoms. This toxin is inactivated usually by heat or chemical. Then this toxin is injected into the individual. By doing this, the body can create antibodies against the toxin. And if the body comes into contact with the toxin, it will then have the ability to neutralize it. Toxoid vaccines include diphtheria and tetanus, part of the DTAP combined immunization. Finally, subunit and conjugate vaccines only contain pieces of the pathogens they protect against. This can include pieces like its protein, sugar, or capsid. Because these vaccines use specific pieces of the pathogens, it allows the body to create a very strong immune response against it. Subunit conjugate vaccinations include hepatitis B, influenza, the injection, haemophilus influenza type B, pertussis, which is part of the DTAP combined immunization, pneumococcal, meningococcal, and human papillomavirus. Now, how do these conventional vaccines differ from the new type of vaccination we're hearing about, the mRNA vaccine? Now, if we take a look at all those conventional vaccines, we'll see that in order to trigger an immune response, these conventional vaccines put some sort of weakened or maybe even inactivated virus or bacteria into the body. However, with mRNA vaccines, 
the body is using that mRNA to make a specific protein. This protein is going to trigger the immune response inside the body. In the case of the new mRNA vaccine that just came out for COVID-19, the mRNA is coding for what is called a spike protein. This spike protein is found on the surface of COVID-19, and when the body gets this mRNA signal and makes this spike protein, the body will make antibodies against this spike protein. Therefore, if COVID-19 were to enter into the body, antibodies would already be present to bind to COVID-19 and neutralize it. Now that you know what conventional vaccines and mRNA vaccines are, let's do a quick recap on the differences between them. Conventional vaccines can be live attenuated vaccinations, which are made from live viruses or bacteria that have been weakened or altered, or they can be made from inactivated or killed organisms, inactivated toxins, or again, um, containing some part of that pathogen. So conventional vaccines use some part of the virus or bacteria, whether it be live or killed or a piece of it, in order to make vaccinations. While mRNA vaccines include just the code for the mRNA, this mRNA, once in the cell, can then make the protein that it codes for. The production time for conventional vaccines can take months or even years, depending on what type of conventional vaccine is being made. For example, the measles virus vaccination that we use today was actually isolated from a child with measles disease in 1954. This disease is a live attenuated vaccination, which takes a lot longer to make because it needs to be passed through several cultures in order to be weakened. It took almost 10 years of passing this virus through several different cultures in order to transform it from the wild type virus which causes disease into the attenuated vaccine virus. So depending on what type of conventional vaccine we're talking about, it could be a very long time before it's made safe enough in order to be given to an individual. The production time for RNA vaccines is much shorter because RNA can be synthesized in a lab. It's a lot quicker to be able to produce an experimental batch. In some cases, an experimental batch of RNA vaccine can be made in as little as a week. Of course, this still needs to be tested afterwards, but getting to the point where these vaccines can be tested, RNA vaccines are going to get there much quicker than conventional vaccines. And finally, we can talk about a few safety issues. When you're referring to conventional vaccines and you have to grow a lot of virus, this could lead to a potential safety hazard having to grow all that virus in the laboratory. Whereas with mRNA vaccines, no virus is needed only to initially get that protein that you're going to make uh, the mRNA against. But then once you're synthesizing it and growing it in large quantities, you're no longer using the virus, you're only using the mRNA. The other potential issue, again, when you're talking about live attenuated vaccines, is that it could have the ability to revert back to its oris original pathogenic, which is the disease-causing form. Now this has happened, and it's known to only have happened with the live oral polio vaccine. Whereas with the mRNA vaccines, these vaccines only include the mRNA that codes for the protein, and so there is no live or attenuated virus to worry about. I wanna thank you so much for watching my video. I hope this cleared up any questions you may have had on conventional vaccines, what they are, and how they differ from the new mRNA vaccinations. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure to leave them below. Thank you.